Oke, okay, selamat pagi semuanya. Sepertinya bisa kita mulai sekarang ya. Oke, okay, good morning everyone. I think we can start now. Good morning and welcome to our webinar this morning where we will be discussing the implementation of just energy transition in Indonesia. My name is Anissa Suarsono. I am the energy policy associate at IISD and I will be your moderator for this morning session. In this webinar, which will be running for about one and a half hours, we will be discussing several critical issues with regards to Indonesia's energy transition, as well as the implications for the Paris Agreement. We will try to explore how just energy transition partnership or JETP can, in this case, ensure that we have better energy transition and how international cooperation can further this transition for Indonesia. The energy scenario in this case plays a key role for the transformation of the energy sector so that we can stay within the limit of the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase as agreed in the Paris Agreement. And we are also doing revisions at the, more, at the moment, so it is important for us to understand how this can have an impact on the achievement of the Paris Agreement. So we will firstly explore the newest report from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, where we will be discussing on how we can achieve that 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. This provides guidelines for the policymakers and corporations on how we can align decisions with the Paris Agreement. And in addition, we will also have the second presentation, which will be delivered by Ibu Satya from the National Energy Council. Hello, Pat Satya. And then the third presentation will be delivered by Mas Deon. Hello, Mas Deon. After hearing the three presentations, we will then have a panel discussion. So we have the panelists here, Ibu Mukti Handayani Suryamun from IRED. We have Pak Gangan Dirgantara from PTSMI. And we will also have a Q&A with the participants. Now, before we proceed with the main agenda, just some housekeeping rules. This webinar will be recorded and the recorded can be accessed via the YouTube channel of IISD. If you need interpretation, we, you can click on the globe icon, which is interpretation. And for the participants who would like to pose questions, either for the presenters or the panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. And the questions will be addressed at the end. For Pasatya's session, if you would like to ask questions, please do write your questions directly and Pasatya will immediately address them after his presentation. Okay, so to save time, I think we can proceed with the first presentation. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the first presentation on navigating energy transitions, mapping the road to one and a half degrees Celsius will be presented by Olivia von Kurs, policy analyst from ISD. Olivia, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. Thank you so much. So th th thank you everyone for, for being here today and Danisa for the, the moderation. So indeed, as um, you mentioned, my presentation would mainly focus on the findings of a recent report that we launched at the end of last year called Navigating Energy Transitions. And uh, so I will mainly try to answer the following question, which is what do energy scenarios tell us about the 1.5 degree compatible energy future? So I will base my, 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 my findings on global models and then deep dive a bit further into regional disaggregation afterwards. So first of all, integrated assessment models are most useful to inform climate policies for a few key reasons. So they enable us to understand how various policy choices affect our ability to comply with different climate goals. So by tweaking different assumptions in the model, using different policy and technology choices, then we can see what are their impact on different key element in the energy transitions. So there are really sort of the best tool we have to assess sort of the global changes in the economic, social and climatic system together. So that's why the influence expectation of energy producers, consumers, investor and policymakers on the expectation on the global energy supply outlook. So in terms that helps to steer energy producers' investment decision and financial actors' assessment of the trends in the energy markets. 
However, there are a few key um, challenges of using integrated assessment model, and one of which is that many of them tend to use large scale carbon sequestration to levels that remain unfeasible and unviable at, at certain scale at, um, by, as we advance in the, um, in, in the centuries. So out of the 1,200 pathways that were considered by the IPCC working group three, there's only about 100 that actually limits warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And out of these 100 pathways, then we, we extracted all of the data on the amount of carbon sequestration with fossil carbon capture and storage, bioenergy carbon capture and storage, and afforestation and reforestation. So all of these sequestration will be required to um, reach net zero and limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, we limited their deployment to level that are considered feasible and sustainable by the IPCC itself. So that enabled us to select a subgroup of 26 pathways, 1.5 degree pathway, from which we extracted key features of the energy transition. So we took median estimates out of these 26 to inform what the energy transition should look like based on them. So one of the first things that we looked at is the oil and gas phase out pathway. So I'll, as all of you may know or not, the International Energy Agency uh, now publishes annually um, uh, a net zero energy pathway, which limits warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in this pathway, um, we see that oil and gas phase out really fast and so fast that actually they came to the conclusion that there was no room for new oil and gas development worldwide. And what we found from our analysis of IPCC scenario is that this is also confirmed from 1.5 degree aligned IPCC scenario and actually like the oil and gas phase out pathway is even steeper in the upcoming decades. And the reason why that's the case is because there's enough oil and gas embodied in the fields that are already producing or under development as of today. So here in the gray, you see the embodied carbon emission in these field. So every new field and new development that come out of more exploration are all in excess of what would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5. And basically, so that, yeah, so the selected IPCC pathway that we found that confirmed the IA conclusion that there's no room for oil and gas development. And then in order to, Test the robustness of this conclusion, we also looked at several other pathways from ARENA, from Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, and also other energy consultancy. And so what's important to look at in this graph is that all of the pathway lead to an at least 65% reduction in oil and gas production by the middle of the century. And we also observed that the more we use carbon dioxide removal, well, the, the less uh, steep the phase out pathway looks like. So these oil and gas phase out pathway are extremely sensitive to the assumption made on carbon dioxide removal, so CCS, bioenergy carbon capture and storage, and afforestation reforestation. Actually, the, the top pathway here in this line, that's actually the British, uh, British Petroleum pathway, which is the least ambitious. And it's the only pathway here that doesn't meet actually the IPCC feasibility and sustainability threshold for the deployment of uh, carbon sequestration technology. So in order to phase out oil and gas at this rate and avoid having to develop a new oil and gas development, then we need to phase in wind and solar capacity extremely fast. And uh, so much so that we need about 830 billion of investment in oil and gas by 2030 annually. So these are annual deployment um, figure in terms of billions of dollars. Um, however, by 2030, we only expect to have about half of the required amounts, so only less than 400 billion per year being invested. So this leaves a significant investment gap of more than 450 billion annually. However, what we found from looking at the spending in, um, in new oil and gas fields that are incompatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is that there's more forecasted investment in this field that are incompatible with limiting warming to 1.5, then are required to close the investment gap in wind and solar. So this is just to mention that there's no lack of energy investment worldwide, but it's simply that they're being invested in the wrong places and we need to reorient and mobilize private capital flows towards the energy transition. However, these needs are really different across the region. Right. So as we can see here in this graph that shows the cumulative 
wind and solar capacity deployment needs in gigawatt um, over the rest of the decade is that in Asian economies, except Japan, we have by far sort of the highest need for wind and solar capacity deployment but until the end of the, the decade. And actually the biggest gap, you see that the gap in for wind is extremely high compared to other regions. And there's about 350 gigawatt that are missing compared to the forecasts that are expected. So basically saying that there's a huge potential there, but then there's a lack of project pipeline and a lack of um, the finance going in, um, in Asia for wind uh, power. And then the solar deployment gap is about the same size as well, but a bit less large relative, relative to other regions. So basically in order to guide and steer the um, international climate finance towards um, where it's most needed, we also need to consider equity consideration in integrated assessment models. So IAM can be used as a tool to inform policymaker about how to deploy um, investment and how to inform the, the JPs also like where the, the investment is most needed in which region and how much but typically, energy models have mostly relied on least cost assumption, which was kind of an issue because it typically implies that the biggest mitigation efforts are carried out where they are the cheapest. So this tend to lead to higher burden on developing countries and ignore the principle of differentiated responsibility and respective capacities. So one or more of the ethical principles that are listed here, I'm not gonna go into each one of them, but they help to model equality, responsibility for past emission, capacity to deliver mitigation. And this can all be modeled in, um, in integrated assessment model. And this helps to determine sort of the, the speed and scale of the energy transition between and across country. And this can also help to steer decision maker, multilateral development banks and donor countries in order to assess sort of the need and and um, channel the capital towards uh, where it's most needed. So in order to conclude here, and uh, this is what is the key messages, key takeaway that I would like you to remember from uh, my presentation. So first of all, is that all major energy pathways showed that new oil and gas field are not needed to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And actually in our selected IPCC 1.5 degree pathway, we showed that we need at least 30% reduction in oil and gas reduction by 2030 and 65% by 2050. So in order to get there, then government need to provide much better and higher support for wind and solar deployment. So the investment gap, uh, the annual investment gap is 450 billion for wind and solar combined by 2030. Uh, but then much more capital is actually forecasted to be spent in new oil and gas development, which should be avoided if we're to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and or avoid significantly stranded asset and um, having to retire um, fields before the end of the economic lifetime. So energy and climate model have a role there to inform policymaker and they can better integrate ethical principle and reflect the capacity to deliver and provide more evidence for the energy transition. So these next generation IEM are starting to um, to be uh, to be available now. So there's a few like the Engage model by Ayasa, which provide a better assessment of fair share and uh, provide more support for increasing climate finance towards developing country and emerging economies. So on this, um, thank you for um, for being here today. And this is our, our report that we launched at the end of last year. So there will be links and, uh, and an email shared to you uh, after this uh, webinar. So we'll pass back the mic to Anissa. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Olivia, for the presentation. Um, next up, untuk presentasi kedua adalah dengan Pak uh, Next up, we will hear the next presentation. But before that, perhaps we can quickly take a photo while you're still here. Let's drop it, feel free and do a countdown. Okay, ready, three, Two, one. One more time. 
freestyle. Please wave to the screen. Thank you very much. And back to you, Ibuna Anissa. Okay, thank you for the time. And we will now proceed with the second presentation, which is about the implications of 1.5 degrees talent scenarios for fossil fuel futures in Indonesia, which will be delivered by Ibu Satya Widya Yuda, who is currently a member of the board of the National Energy Council. The time and place is yours. Thank you very much, Ibu Anissa. Thank you as well to the speakers joining here today. Let me share my slide presentations here. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, let's. <clears throat> so can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Ya. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, terima kasih atas uh, kesempatan yang diberikan. So, thank you very much for the opportunity provided. And we have heard about the presentation that was given by Olivier. And I think in this case this shows a view that we have also been thinking about for quite some time within the Indonesian government to do the mitigation so that we can ensure that our emissions can be reduced. And so that the implication from the 1.5 degree scenario can indeed be realized. But I would also like to be frank that what was just delivered is not easy for us to achieve. You set a very high tone to face that fossil fuel. From Indonesia's side, there are several angles that we are trying to evaluate. But Satya, sorry to cut you. Can you perhaps choose presentation mode so that we can see your presentation in full screen? Thank you. So we are trying to ensure that we can maintain energy security. And we also try to comply with the NDC. And we are trying to also ensure that our NDCs can be achieved. In the most updated NDC, we have actually set an even more ambitious target. And in this case, we are also trying to ensure that we can combine on the one hand to reduce carbon emissions and on the other hand, to ensure that we can maintain our economic growth. And we've also heard about this from the president during COP26 in Glasgow. And Indonesia cannot work alone to achieve this. Indonesia would require assistance from other countries in order to achieve the net zero emissions in 2060. And as such, climate finance then becomes crucial for Indonesia to achieve this. Now, in my opinion, this is slightly different from what Olivia was mentioning. And I will elaborate further about the government strategy as well as the constraints of the government. Nevertheless, we do have a strategy that I think we can comprehensively understand here. So basically, we, our intention here is to decarbonize fossil. We are not intending to immediately phase out fossil fuel we would like to have a gradual approach. So we are trying to utilize fossil still, but at the same time, we're trying to maximize net carbon sink, carbon capture, and so on. And indeed, as we've heard from Olivier, it is not fully proven at this stage. So we are still also waiting for CCU and CCS to be commercially viable. And at the same time, we are also increasing renewable energy, for example, through electric vehicles, the utilization of hydrogen, because this is also something that the European community would like. 
and this is for green as well as blue hydrogen. So ladies and gentlemen, as part of our efforts to ensure energy security, as well as low carbon development and resilience, in this case, we want to ensure that we can also achieve energy security, but at the same time, also achieve our sustainable development. All of these efforts then constitute our strategy. In this case, we are not only going for radical change, but we will try our best to decarbonize fossil. Still, the renewable can then take off. And as mentioned by the president, we cannot work alone. As such, we do require the support from the developed countries. We require them to have technologies and innovations that can also accelerate the development of renewables in the future because Indonesia needs to deal with stranded assets. So if we are discussing about the capacity of our power plant, our power plant which is still dominated by coal, well, we will certainly try with JetP and the energy transition mechanism to further accelerate the early retirement of coal power plant. And in this case, the penetration of renewable energy can be smooth and can be well implemented. And we are trying to achieve the NDC and at the same time, we are also trying to ensure that our economy can continue to run. And we want to have innovations as well as technology that can also allow us to ensure that these innovations can be well implemented. And this is also a strategy for us. And we have also tried to do it in several occasions. So if there is any acceleration for these processes, then we will also depend on our financial capacity as well as all of the stakeholders that are participating. Now, going on to the next slide. So at the National Energy Council, we are trying to exit the middle income trap. And we are trying to ensure that our economic growth is between five to 6%. So this is done on an aggregate basis. So within these scenarios to reduce the carbon emissions, And there are several tools. So we have AIMS, the Computable General Equilibrium, and we also have the Pakistan approach as well here. Bapanas also uses a system dynamic, which is the strategy for net zero. And this also refers to 5.2%. And actually all of this is also calculated by considering the average population growth. So in this case, we are also trying to understand if let's say we want to decarbonize our industry, then we would need to refer to the macro assumptions that have already been decided together with a number of institutions. We can also see here that in the scenario of economic growth of 6%, there are two dominant sectors mentioned, namely industry and transportation sectors. And we can see in the next slides about the domination of both sectors. So this reflects the growth of the industry and the industry growth scenario with 6% of growth. And if we use the low scenario, our energy consumption will be 1.35 ton oil equivalent per capita, 
Well, in the world, the number is 1.32, with the highest or the highest scenario is 1.5, but OECD, they have already reached over two. With regard to electric consumption, we hope to reach between 5,500 to 6,500 kilowatt hours per capita. The average world is 3,500, while OECD is already 7,085. By using the second scenario, we are more optimistic that our economic growth would be 5.9%. And we hope that our electricity consumption will be 6,500. As for the primary energy supply, when we look at the low part is 2.5, while the world average is 1.7, it can be said that we are already above the average. So our goal of getting rid of middle income trap by 2023 can be achieved. This one shows the final energy consumption. When we look at the final energy consumption, as I mentioned earlier, we can see here how industry and transportation became two sectors with major final energy consumptions. So if the final energy consumption is dominated by these two sectors, hence those are the two sectors that we have to focus on reducing the carbon emission. This is the high scenario. Everything is the same, only differs in number. This one is the demand and supply scenario. It is mentioned that until 2060, our electricity consumption is projected to achieve several terawatt hours. And as I've mentioned, it is mostly dominated by industry and transportation sectors. This is equal to what we see in 2060, which is 5,600 kilowatt hours per capita. We do not get rid of fossil fuel immediately, but we hope that by 2060, almost all electricity will be generated by renewable energy plants, about 3,800 gigawatts, and the rest will come from nuclear power plant. The total is 522, and the rest will be the decarbonized fossil based. So we will keep trying to reduce the emission until we phase out completely and we can rely on the renewables. This is the electricity demand. I will not discuss about it too deeply, as long as you can understand that the dominant sectors here are transportation and industry. So this is what we want to focus on in reducing the carbon emission. And here is the electricity generation. In 2060, we can see that solar proportion is rather high in addition to hydro and also nuclear. Olivier earlier said that they wanted to speed up the wind and solar. Indonesia doesn't have a really good quality wind, but we have rather good capacity in hydro and nuclear, and we can push forward the geothermal. Although geothermal seems to be very small here, the green bar, but since the capacity of the resources that we have is 27,000 megawatts, the maximum amount that we can contribute from geothermal is that number. Of course, we are still less competitive compared to solar and hydro. And we, uh, there are also several ideas to decarbonize the existing fossils, such as co-firing and other ways. Uh, this is also similar, but we apply the larger scenario here, or high scenario. Now let's have a look at the reduction of the carbon emission. As you can see here, in 2060, the number would be 83%, coming from energy sector. It is hoped to come from the use of electric vehicles. 
we also engage the Ministry of Environment because if we want to achieve net zero, of course, the amount of emission in the energy sector must be absorbed. So this is when we talk about the use of energy. So that's why we have power plant here, industry, commercial, households, as well as transportation sectors. This is also similar, but we use higher scenario. I believe I don't have to repeat this joint statement of different governments, but the point here is that Indonesia plays a significant role in JETP, especially to reduce the carbon emission and JETP pushes it forward to achieve 1.5 degrees Celsius. So it doesn't allow any further oil and gas development if we want to really refer to this target, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Of course, we believe that JFP, together with international partner groups, can jointly help Indonesia to accelerate the early retirement of our existing assets, be it coal power plants as well as oil and gas. If we can make this true, come true, what JETP is doing is very crucial. As in line, it is in line with the expectation of our president that he expressed in the opening of COP26 in Glasgow. I believe I don't have to elaborate this one by one because this can be accessed by public already and you can see what the government of Indonesia will do. But again, in principle, we have seen here, there is JETP investment plan. And what we are doing now is accelerating the transition. But Anissa and everyone here, please be advised that we need consistency at the global level because we don't want to see that we work so hard, but the, the world is not consistent with their efforts. In the next couple of years, we will see the increasing growth of coal consumption. So we will not see the decrease in our consumption, but instead it's the opposite. So this is what I meant by inconsistency, inconsistency of the world. India and China imported all, a huge number of calls and we have to take in this into account so that the world's aspiration to reduce carbon emission and achieve the 1.5 degrees celsius can become a reality and we can see all the steps here and i believe our colleagues here can elaborate more on this starting from jetway investment and policy establishment we hope that early retirement of the coal fire, fire plan can be immediately started before 2030. But again, it's all subject to finance availability and the success of the energy transition mechanism that we have. That would be all from me. I hope this can provide you with some insight regarding Indonesia's position in reducing carbon emission and also maintaining our economic growth so that by 2033, we can get rid completely from the middle income trap. Thank you very much. Peace be upon you. Thank you very much for your very informative presentation, sir. Pasiati unfortunately has to attend another meet. So for the Q&A, feel free, everyone, if you have any questions, we'll do it now. We have a couple of questions coming in already. In your opinion, pa, Satya, what do we have to do to smooth the process of JSP Indonesia? What do we have to pay attention on so that the program can run smoothly? And secondly, Indonesia's energy transition needs value is higher compared to the JSP's number. 
or get this value. So what would be the next steps by the government of Indonesia? I think those are excellent questions because all of them challenged our financial capacity to reduce the carbon emission, especially if we talk about early retirement of coal fire plants. Many people think that currently our RE penetration is not really that massive for power plants, especially due to overcapacity by PLN and also the retirement process that is still trying to go faster. The financial scheme that can accelerate the early retirement of coal fire plant became a key, therefore, because otherwise we know that it's easier talked than done. Because in reality, when we talk about power plant, we are facing a lot of barriers, and that's why Indonesia attempts to focus on two important sectors, transportation and industry. Transportation with 34%, industry with 55%. That's why we are also trying to catch up with the transportation sector so that the reduction of our carbon emission will not be disturbed and we can achieve net zero by 2060. And therefore, our agreement with the Ministry of Environment to ask them to help absorb the emission is not an easy agreement. We do our best within the capacity of our own ministry as well as other ministry. If we sit in Nurbaya, the Minister of Environment is also member of National Energy Council or DEN. And hopefully we can achieve the net zero. But more importantly, agreement among all stakeholders. And that's why the president himself said in the meeting that all steps of our energy transition must be implementable. Currently, we are working on every step by involving the state-owned enterprise or SOEs so that they can catch up or so that they can ensure that the strategy is implementable. We still don't have any showcase regarding CTS or CCUS in coal power plant. CCS and CCUS in oil and gas is mostly about oil recovery or lifting oil and gas. If we can store, if the US works, we can check whether it is commercially viable or not. Maybe today in the oil and gas company, you can include it into the sharing contract, production sharing contract, but can you put it into another item? This is what is important. We ask our SOEs to present their plan about this, including the development of hydrogen. Many of the SOEs said that we can develop hydrogen using our existing geothermal. How can we convert hydrogen to become ammonia so that they can be transported? Industry must talk as well. So what I presented to you earlier regarding the major scheme of our transition, Please be advised that it's not easy at all unless we engage the industrial sector. Of course, now we are still focusing on SOEs, but in the next step, we will engage also the Chamber of Commerce and private sector to support our strategies. Thank you very much, Vasit. Yeah. One last question, and after that, we'll have to move on to the next presentation. How Indonesia should start its transition? Jadi proyek low hanging fruit di Indonesia itu sebaiknya dimulai. What are the low hanging fruits project in Indonesia? Is there any sector that you would categorize as the enabling sector for this? A sector that can push the transition further. When we talk about what we can do today, if we are talking about the emission of carbon, there are a lot of ways to do. We have already asked all industries to quantify their produced emissions and what is their plan for the next one year or for the next two years. In transportation sector, it's also obvious that some initiatives to develop electric vehicles have been done massively.
we have already set up a target of hundreds of thousands over the next five years and, and, and a, a several millions of vehicles in the next decades. So this is one of the steps that we can take in the near future. As for the electricity, what we can do right now is co-firing using biomass. I think that is at least that will at least contribute to the reduction of emission until we reach the point of having sufficient finance so that we can accelerate the retirement. PLN, the state of electricity company, has already had the retirement plan, but with jet P mechanism, we can achieve that even earlier. It is so good to be true if we can really implement this all of us are waiting and hopefully it can be done properly. All right, thank you very much, Pasetia, for your presentation and your answers to the discussion questions. Now let's move on to the third presentation. So Pasetia, feel free to have to leave. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Anissa, Pak Luki, and Pak Dion. Thank you. The third one is Mas Dion Arinaldo, the manager of the Transform Energy Transformation from Institute for Essential Service Reforms. To Mas Dion, the floor is yours, but you only have 10 minutes. Thank you. All right, let me start sharing the presentation now. Thank you for the time, Nisa, and thank you, Pak Setia, for your informative presentation as well. And thank you very much, Olivier, for your presentation regarding global 1.5 degrees Celsius target. My presentation will highlight only the 1.5 in Indonesian context. My presentation is based on our study together with Finland University of Technology and GORA in 2021. So we developed a model of energy overall energy system, which covers transport and industry sectors we try to figure out how to decarbonize those factors in line with the 1.5 degree Celsius roadmap. Talking about roadmap, the main concern here is the greenhouse gas emission. When we look at the left side, there are several lines there. The black one is the historical emission of Indonesian energy system but we do not include emission from other sector here. And we can see here the 1.5 or NDC target compared to others. If I'm not mistaken, the number is not too far from the reality, About it's still about 1,100. So NDC is located up, upside here. But when we talk about 1.5, Indonesia's pathway must be at, at least the lowest part here. It's similar to the global pathway, which means emission must start being reduced after 2030. And for the energy sector, as it is considered as low hanging fruit, it should start decreasing by 2025. So we can say that that is the target. So that is our main concern. And from this modeling, we can also see what are the milestones that Indonesia has to achieve so that we can reduce the emission in line with the target as shown on the yellow line. So there are three stages of change that we need to achieve to reduce the emission. The emission here still increases compared to base year 2000. To 2030, but the peak has already happened in between. What are the changes? You can see on this description here. I will not read them out one by one here, but these three sectors electricity, industry, and transport if you really want to achieve the 1.5, all these three sectors must start decreasing its emission until 2030. From 2030 until 2045, the reduction will be the most massive one until in the end it reaches zero. 
So when we talk about net zero emission scenario, there have been several studies conducted in Indonesia that highlights this NZE scenario. But Satya has mentioned earlier about this, and we also have other scenarios here, such as IRENA and IESR. When we compare the capacity of the renewable energy or electricity generators, the number will become so high from the renewable energy. In the ESDM scenario, it, or MEMR, it should be 30%. In IEA, the, even the VRA must achieve 55%. In IRENA, the number is 64%. In our scenario, which is the most ambitious one, is 88%. The point I would like to see is that all the net zero emission scenarios show that the shares of renewable energy must be increased significantly. The number should be at least, if we refer to the MRME, MEMR scenario, is 500 gigawatt, and that's only for solar and doesn't include the other renewable energies. The gap here is hundreds of gigawatts, and therefore we need to develop further this RE. So it is clear that in the near future, we have to support fully the RE development because we cannot just build the RE power plant in the, in the, next, in the last 10 years of our target. We have to start from now, and the opportunity is there because the price has, going down, has gone down. So this is something about the modeling. I'll just go shortly. So in this case, we can also see another more extreme scenario where renewable energy is up to 95%. So actually, this is technically feasible. But what we need to ensure is how we can mitigate the adjustments or the balancing between supply and demand. And indeed, because there is a lot of solar, then this is how it looks like. So in this case, we can clearly see that for the case of solar, most of it is produced in the afternoon. And we can see that it is consumed for orange and also red. So that is for power to fuel as well as battery. And that will be used for the nighttime, for battery discharge at the nighttime. And we can use it for synthetic fuel, green hydrogen, and so on. And next is there might be some excess, there might be some curtailment as well. And there can also be connection to other grid. So this is slightly different. If let's say we have a worse solar week in 2050. So I think it's clear here that interconnection is the key. And we're trying to understand why this is important. Because I think the potential here is well distributed. And I think the largest demand is in Java and Bali. And on the other hand, the potential of renewable energy is still within the non-Java islands. So we need to have interconnection. That's the orange line here, which we are trying to strengthen further till 2050. And here for orange, this is the capacity for interconnection. So I think this is just an illustration of a potential scenario that Indonesia can implement to stay within the 1.5 degree Celsius target. And I think in this case, one of the challenge here is indeed investment. And as I mentioned, we have storage, we have grid, we have electrolysis, which is for the power to fuel and so on. So actually, when we evaluate the investment needs, it reaches 1.3 trillion. And we, we take the average, then that's about 40 billion per year. So what's interesting here is that the conclusion is actually similar to what Olivia was mentioning earlier. Actually, 40 billion is very much realistic for Indonesia's system, but it's still mainly allocated for fossil fuel. 
for last year, it was between 30 to 35 billion, although still mainly in oil and gas, as well as non-renewable power sectors. For renewable, it's only 1.5 at the moment. So we do need to shift the investment and we do need support for that. So we need to be able to reallocate this investment further so that we can also further strengthen the network and also utilize other forms of clean energy technology. This slide is not for conclusions, but this is just some fruit for thoughts. If we are to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius target, we cannot use the BAU. So we need to change our mindset. We need to change the way that we work. We need to change the way that the energy system operates as well. If let's say this 1.5 degrees Celsius target is a constraint, well, we need to make changes in many aspects. Firstly, from policy side, we realize that there are differences. There's still a gap between the current energy system versus the type of system that is required later on. So we need to have clear energy planning. We need to have clear energy policies as well. So Indonesia, as a developing country, could actually leapfrog of its technology. And it should ideally be based on what has been commercially proven. So we can evaluate what types of clean energy technology has been proven, and we can include that in our main strategy. And later down the road, maybe 10 years from now, when there are developments in the technology, then we can also see what is reviewed in the five in every five years. And I think Indonesia also has great potential in this case to develop its technology and its industry because Indonesia has great development. And in this case, electric vehicle is also supported. So this should also be part of the strategy for economic development. If it is a strategy for economic development, then the social development needs to also be prepared. So we need to ensure that the demand is also ensured. And next is about the electric system. So as previously mentioned in the NZE scenario, this is to do with the VRE. We need to move on from the paradigm of baseload utilization. So we need to see how power system provides flexibility. And this is also how we can supply electricity at an affordable price. And in this case, the state also has rights and they need to utilize these resources as best as possible for the population. So I think I don't have much more time. So uh, this is just some food for thoughts. Back to you, Anissa. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, Thank you to all of the presenters. And next, we will proceed with the panel discussion. So we have Ibu Mukti Handayani Sujahmun from IREP, as well as Pak Gangan Dirgantara from PTSMI. So we will start by hearing from the panelists about the presentation. And then we can also hear about the expectations. And Bakuki, perhaps you can start first, because ladies first and you have five to 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Anissa, ladies and gentlemen, greetings and may peace be upon us. So I think the presentation that was shared is very interesting. Thank you, Masluki and IISD for conducting this webinar. We've heard from Olivier on the modeling that is required to achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius scenario. 
and how the challenges that we are facing is not only within the coal sector actually, but we need to take a helicopter view. We need to not only address coal, but also address other sectors, for example, oil and gas. And I also agree with the point that Pasatia was mentioning and also that Olivia mentioned that indeed, ideally, we need to have a model that represents the conditions. Because if we're discussing about UNFCCC, Paris Agreement, well, one of the basic principles for that is common but differentiated responsibilities based on respective capabilities. And there are also national circumstances. So we cannot just try to say that, oh, we don't need to have coal in this year, that year, and so on. It's not as easy as that. Moreover, in the last years, we found that, and this is something that I believe that we can no longer deny, the demand for fossil is actually increasing. So we are in a very difficult condition, I believe. Because if we stop fossil fuel, then there's an opportunity cost. But if we want to actually expand the industry and the market, then that might also end up as stranded assets. So when we are discussing about modeling, I think we do need to strengthen it further while evaluating the conditions of each country. And I think Pak Satya and Mas Dion also already discussed about energy transition in Indonesia. From my side, the way I see it, we do need to undergo energy transition. It seems like we do not have any more options. It's inevitable. But the challenge here is how quickly, as well as which approach we will be using. Because as Mas Dion mentioned, we can no longer do the BAU. And then from my perspective, sometimes we are overly focused on two key issues. I agree that these two issues are crucial. The first one is financing. We need to ensure that financing is also guaranteed because if we want to do anything that requires fund. And next is technology. It's two sides of the coin. We can either work together so that we can ensure that we have good access to technology or we need to purchase from the market. If we were to do that, then that means that we need to have strong financial resources. I think SMI would be the one who knows about that. And I think in this case, there are things that we often forget about. The first one is the just element. So if we are discussing about energy transition, we cannot discuss about energy transition as it is, because that would be costly. And as also mentioned by Pak Satya, this will have an impact on the energy resilience. This will have an impact on affordability. So we need to ensure that it is just. And we need to also evaluate it from not only just in the sense that it is cheap, let's say, but we need to also ensure that other aspects are also covered. For example, proficiency of technology. Mastion, I believe you can comment on this further as well. So when we are discussing about technology, this then closely relates to the human resources. So how can we prepare our human resources so that we can do this transition, we can align with it. Because we want to ensure that our human resources are also well equipped.
and I think this is also the element for human resources. And next, when we are discussing about energy transition, and I think I also saw this from Pa Satya's presentation, at the end of the day, we are aiming to have electrification. But the challenge here is that we are still dealing with fossil based power plants. And we need to also consider their remaining lifetime, right? So in this case, well, I'm also not fully sure about the processes that we have in the government with regards to the legal process, because at the end of the day, it's how do we ensure that we are not actually violating the contract? So can JETB cover that? When we're dealing with contract terminations or contract addendums, then there will be cost consequences. Another thing that I think is also important is on how we can also ensure that the other aspects are also well covered. Not only contracts between, let's say, the IPP and PLN, but also how do we ensure that we can also consider the potential impacts on the human resources? Would it be easy for them to shift? Or how would it look like? Because this is certainly something that we need to consider and it is also important. We cannot just aim for just energy transition partnership and only focus on funding and technology. That's all for now. Thank you, Manisa. Okay, thank you very much, Makoki. So we will discuss some of the points that Bakuki mentioned, and Pagangan, feel free to give a response. Thank you very much, Ba Anisa. So, due to the limited time, I'll just go straight to the point. So, theoretically, and from a planning point of view, I agree with what the speakers were mentioning. I just want to underline or explore about the big issue that Bakuki mentioned, which is about financing. So as we know, PTSMI has been appointed to become the country platform manager. And in short, our duty is to integrate fiscal support and other sources so that we can also use it as a source of financing and also de-risking facility. And at the same time, how we can ensure that we have sustainable energy transition. So there are two products here that we try to produce. The first is the financing modality. And then the second is fund mobilization. We then try to ensure that we have a blended finance structure. So blended finance is indeed a neutral terminology. We can view it as something that's positive as well as negative, depending on what we are blending. Why do we need this? Because as we know, the world has just recovered from the pandemic. And in the last year's G20 meeting, this was also delved in quite detail actually. This was done in climate change events as well as in energy related events. So basically, governments worldwide are facing fiscal constraints. Moreover, because in this case, energy transition oftentimes is considered to not be a priority. Within blended finance, we try to mobilize all types of financing that we could potentially utilize and we try to utilize the economic value of carbon. So we are implementing carbon tax and also carbon trade. Now we need to be careful when we are determining the tax to impose. 
we want to ensure that it does not become a discouraging factor for the RE developers or for those taxpayers. So we need to be very careful in determining the tax. And next, we want to ensure that we have the carbon rate developed. At the moment, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources have declared that they will be implementing this in the subsector for coal power plant. And they're trying to implement it as a pilot. And the energy transition financing products that SMI is trying to offer consists of three things mainly. The first one is to prepare a results-based loan. So in this case, we want to ensure that we are able to support the early retirement of coal power plants. And we hope to be able to provide better financing for that. And next is to divestment or asset skim off, which is done by PLN. So that we can increase the effectiveness of the energy produced from the coal power plants that are managed by PLN. So these are two things that we need to do. And next is for IPP. We want to also provide our support for IPP. So these are the three facilities or products that we are offering. And there's also questions on what we can support. So basically energy transition is a long process and we have just started. So the first stage in this case is the RE power development. This is something that we need to continuously do. It is not easy for us to do. And uh, this year, SMI has also supported 35 projects with a total commitment of more than 400 million US dollars and a potential reduction of 300 ton CO2 equivalent. So it's not large scale, And this is also certainly a challenge for us at SMI because all projects in SMI have to go through five due diligence. The first one is technical due diligence, then financial, technical, social, as well as environmental due diligence. So we want to ensure that all of the projects will then be able to also meet the just transition principle. So so we need to also ensure that we are considering the balance of supply and demand. So when the energy supply is good, but the demand is not following, then there might be imbalances in the system and that can also then cause disruption to the market and it can also threaten energy security in Indonesia. Next, I would also like to discuss about what type of needs we need to further boost so that we can have the good energy transition within the context of the energy transition platform. The first is fundraising. We need to continuously do fundraising because as mentioned by Mbak Kuki, we are also trying to get this commitment of $20 billion, but even that is not sufficient. The second one is carbon market framework. And this is what we need to build immediately to ensure that all the carbon emitted or avoided can be used as a source. for financial stream or revenue stream. The third one is transition taxonomy to scale up the private sector participation. 
including foreign banking sector and local banking sector, so that whenever they invest in transitional projects, they will not break the regulation. As mentioned earlier, we need to have to support five things at least. The first one is coal power plant early retirement and grid and transmission. The fourth one is energy supply chain and development of renewable energy, be it nuclear, hydrogen, ammonia, and so forth. Last one is development for non-electricity sector. Currently, we are still focusing only on electricity, but we haven't talked much about the non-electricity sector. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Gan. Since we are running out of time and there are a lot of questions from the participants, let's merge the Q&A discussion and the panel discussion. I would like now to address one of the questions from the participants from Pak Bawa Santoso. This question is, in November 2022, since November 2022, has there been any progress in JetP program? And what is the most updated status regarding its progress with the support, with the money support? I don't know if he is still online. If you are still, we can refer to you, Pak Satya, or otherwise we can go to Pak Gan Gan. All right, thank you. Okay, let me address the question. With regard to JetP progress, currently we are still working on refining the financing modalities and fund mobilization. We'll keep continue doing this and we are also preparing to do the transaction. There are several potential projects that we will support. For early retirement of coal fire coral fire power plant that is possessed by PLN. I also saw a question on chat box. If uh, do we have to always go through SME to do this? No, not always. Any transition energy transition project can be supported not only by SMI, but we have to set the requirements and the conditions of such project. And we have to have the standards about this, which must refer to the energy transition roadmap that will be issued soon by the Ministry of EMR. Thank you, Pa Gan Gan. We have another question from Professor Budira Sudarmo. Using coal power plant would most likely need a Nusantara supergrid. Apakah supergrid ini termasuk? Will the supergrid be part of GNP, GATP or not? Mas Nosa also mentioned about this in his presentation regarding the importance of this grid for renewable energy system. So is the cost involved in this development be part of the renewable energy or GETM? This is one of the options or aspects that we can finance using the JetP scheme. As I mentioned, one of the sectors to be funded is grid and transmission. This allows renewable energy to penetrate into the national electricity grid without disturbing the entire system. Oke, okay. uh, ini nah, ini kayaknya untuk Mbak Kuki ini cocok ya. Jadi dari uh, Erina Mursanti dari Climate Works, just wondering how JP or ETF implementation in Indonesia will include gender equity aspect. A policy brief from ILO on last November discussed in general how just transition must include gender equity. Um, as far as she's concerned, gender equity in Indonesia is also a big concern, but this is not embedded in the just energy transition discourse in Indonesia. Mbak Kuki, ada tanggapannya? Iya, ini pertanyaannya susah sih. <laughs> This is a difficult one. I agree with Erina. But to my knowledge, 
in all JETP elements, they always include JSC or gender equality. But we don't know yet how to which degree this aspect will be implemented and that remains a big issue. But I see that the gender issue must be addressed as well. When we talk about gender, we should not only look at the gender itself, but we have to also take into account marginalized communities and other aspects. I think we have to talk broader than talking about two genders, namely men and women. But we also need to talk about those communities that are not really in advantageous position. This is very important to me because otherwise, we could talk about transition and then to penetrate the, in your, the grid with the renewable energy. But if the renewable energy is not yet supported with smart grid, we'll face different disturbances. This has to be addressed. How can each community groups play their roles? I don't only look at this from the gender perspective, but I also want to look at the roles of various groups. See, everybody raised their hands now. They want to help me addressing the question. So that's my perspective, Anissa. If we only limit this to, to genders only, I think it would be even worse. It's not fair. If we want to talk about equity to all stakeholders, we need to engage all the communities. I, I believe people are waiting in line to give their answers, Manisa. But again, again, please go ahead because you raise your hand first. Thank you. To give you, you some information about what we have done this, ADB supports the government of Indonesia and SMI to develop a framework a strategic framework for environmental and social assessment, what we call as CESA framework. It is currently being developed and it definitely takes into account the gender aspects within. Secondly, PTSMI also develops an analysis regarding the interregional impacts in the context of early retirements. The CFPP Suppose that the one that will be retired in East Java or Central Java, the impact will be felt also in Central Kalimantan as a province that supplies coal. So it will disturb the supply chain. And as Mbak Kuki said in the beginning, it will also disturb different groups of society because they will be affected by this policy. So we have to be really cautious in implementing this policy those impacts cannot be borne by the transaction cost. Hence, the national and subnational governments must really pay attention on the occurring impacts coming out from these policies so that the national and local budget must also contribute in creating new employment and Ministry of Industry must encourage the existing industries to create new employment that can replace those uh, dismissed from the coal fire plant. Would you like to respond, sir? I believe that my answer would be similar to what Pa Gangan said. Uh, this issue is quite broad and there is no single definition that we can refer to when we talk about just transition. When we look at gender from energy transition aspects, I believe there are a lot of more aspects that we need to review further. And Pagangan has also mentioned about the coal power plant and its impacts. When we talk about JES, we need to also pay attention on the currently affected ones. What about the process? How can we engage women's aspiration, for example? There is no single solution for all, but we have to work on this gradually. And some of the just principles that we have agreed on 
we have to adhere to those principles. So just a little input for the process. I think in the Secretariat, they have a working group for JES. I think this can serve as one of the platforms to give our inputs for the process, as well as the investment plan. And I would like to respond also to the grid issue from the cookie. Grid expansion will happen regardless whether we build renewable energy or not, but we need to change the strategy if what we are building is renewable energy compared to if we are building dispatchable power plants. That's why I said we have to be clear about the development direction, what are going what what are we going to build? Because if we want to optimize the investment, everything must be clear. For example, renewable energy will be built in Sumatra, let's say at the amount of five gigawatt in North Sumatra or Aceh. That means if that's the case, we already know that when we say strengthening grid, we are going there in that region to to meet the demand of electricity from North Sumatra, in Medan, in Palembang, and so on. This is a part of power system planning. And I believe this is a must. It would be, of course, better if the renewable energy is developed in different regions or evenly distributed so that the grid development can be optimized instead of expanded. especially in regions that already have power stations, we can focus on those regions first. I think it is very possible to be done and this should be part of our strategy to optimize our investment in the grid. If we learn from other developed countries, investment in grid is still necessary. We need to implement this from now but the existing grid can all already absorb the renewable energy until certain percentage. I think we can adapt that lessons learned to Indonesian context. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your responses, everyone. Due to time limit, this would be our last question that we are going to address from Pak Johannes Kadarusman. Uh, and also for you, Olivier, you're still there, are you? So from Pak Johannes Kadarusman, from various projections shared by the presenters, I'm wondering, other than using various assumptions to create various scenarios, did you input the data on realization or less implementation into the model to we'll see whether that for you, certain maybe. So scenarios... So for the various projections that you presented, other than using various assumptions to, pr uh, to produce scenarios, do you also take into account um, data of realization and implementation, the latest implementation data, uh, to help you to see whether the projection you make is realistic or not? So uh, maybe you first, Olivier, and then we go to Masdeon. Yeah, sure. So um, the, the way we filtered the IPCC 1.5 degree scenarios, actually only by looking at the low and low overshoot scenarios and then um, filtering them based on their deployment capacity for carbon dioxide removal based on um, fossil CCS, bioenergy carbon capture and storage and afforestation and reforestation. So we only filtered on these criteria because of the significant risk associated to this technology if they are expected to deliver certain mitigation outcome and then they fail to do so. So I mean, the the CCS sector has, for the last 30 years, been trying to be commercialized and have has been riddled with cost, cost overrun, failures. And uh, so that's why we we thought it was a certain risk into betting on these technologies. So we used the um, feasibility and sustainability threshold that the IPCC itself deemed to be um, to be uh, the, the limit that we can develop until 2050. So that's the only thing on which we filtered the scenario that we've looked at. Uh, but there are other feasibility concern in terms of uh, scale of potential for wind, solar, other institutional um, criteria that are also available on the um, working group three uh, report from the IPCC that can be, can be easily accessed. Okay, uh, thanks. 
uh, untuk Mas Dion. Go ahead, Mas Dion. I think I have already answered part of this question earlier. So basically the model that we developed that I presented earlier, the main benchmark here, there is one and a half. Indonesia's mission is how to achieve the 1.5 global target. So we need to figure out what kind of model, what kind of system Indonesia has to have and for this reason, we adopted this cross scenario to all Indonesian energy systems I've already mentioned earlier, namely power, industry, and transport. We need to ignore the constraints from the political aspects first or regulatory aspects. What we are comparing now is the head-to-head -head cost of the decarbonization options. So that's what I uh, was presenting. We need to update again because the condition has already changed. So the model is similar to what I've mentioned in 2018. Of course, it was before COVID. And of course, there have been a lot of changes due to overstress condition and so forth. We are currently conducting a study on this for the short term. Our objective is to, to make sure whether those milestones I've already mentioned can still be achieved with current condition. That remains a question to be answered, sir. But if the question is whether 1.5 target is feasible and what kind of change we need to do, I believe it has been partially answered by my presentation. I hope it's clear enough. Thank you. All right, the answer from Mas Dion has already marked at the end of our webinar because we are running out of time. So once again, I would like to thank all the speakers here and the panelists for this very lively and informative discussions. Thank you very much for all the participants for joining us. Turns out that this issue is a big concern for all of you. I'm sorry if we cannot address all your questions. We look forward to meeting you in the next forum and hopefully we can discuss again about, Jet, about JetP. We hope that the government of Indonesia can provide more information for Indonesian audiences regarding JetP, because it turns out that the, the, the enthusiasm of the community is very strong here. Hopefully this can help us building community and public support for this program. I hereby end this webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Mas Deon, Bu Kuki, Magangan, Paluki, and Olivier. Thank you for being thank here. You, thank you. And thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Have a good rest, uh, Olivier. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah, you didn't leave yet. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.